to bring to the stage for our concluding talk one of the giants in exercise physiology from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Mike Joyner. Thank you, uh, Tim, and it's a pleasure to be here. Hero talked about master athletes. Tony talked about baboons, and then we heard about performing artists. In my clinical life, I'm an anesthesiologist, and so my goal today is just to not put you to sleep. So we're going to talk a little bit about gene scores versus the bathroom scale score, or what to do about physical inactivity and obesity, themes that have run throughout the conference. So all good stories have a setup, a conflict, and a resolution. So our setup goes something like this. The obesity epidemic is starting to impact population mortality. If you see what's happening here, this curve shows from 1980 to about 2010, population mortality fell, and it's now starting to stabilize or even go up a little bit. Why is that happening? Well, the simple examples are, or explanations are that diabetes is starting to rise, the decline in cardiovascular disease is starting to tail off, obesity-related cancers are starting to rise, Alzheimer's disease is starting to go up, all things linked to inactivity and obesity, and then of course we have issues like accidents and drug abuse, which are, are really probably not so much exercise or obesity-related. In the U.S., of course, we're number one. You can see the obesity statistics here. The dark blue uh, counties are, are the percentage of people that are obese or overweight. The, the darker the blue, the worse. You can see that there's tremendous overlap with the dark blue counties and the incidence of diabetes. Uh, the southeast and the so-called stroke belt is uh, particularly difficult, particularly troubling. I also like to point out, at least the people in the Big Ten like to point out, that there's a lot of overlap with the Southeastern Conference as well. All right, so the conflict. Conflict goes something like this, and this is what you expect. Exercise and dietary moderation are good. Get people moving and eating better. Via education and guidelines, everything is fixed. We are doing God's work and should all feel validated. And the rationale is things like this. This is physical activity patterns in 650,000 adults. You can see as physical activity goes up, the hazard ratio of all-cause mortality goes down. And you can see that the years of life gain. And with just doing 30 minutes of moderately vigorous physical activity per day, you can get about three or four years of increased life expectancy. If you did do a bit more, you can increase that further. But it starts to flatten off. We know that the population health benefits of a healthy lifestyle are, are, are all there. And the data simply tells us that seven years of increased life expectancy, if you follow the guidelines, and probably 13 years of disability-free life expecting the things that Dr. Tanaka talked about. And you live long and healthy if you do these sorts of things, and more importantly, you die fast. And here's a little example. Uh, I didn't want the person from the University of Texas to have the last word. This lady's 92, and I would argue that this performance might top the 88-year-old sprinter that Hero showed you. We were out watching the cadets this morning. I didn't see anybody do this. I saw a lot of people doing pull-ups, push-ups, burpees, and bar dips, but not this. That's hard. And my guess is if you see this last thing, we'll all agree that this lady is at low risk for hip fracture. <laughs> so except diets don't work. These are four popular diets. Atkins own Weight Watchers and Ornish. These are people that are put on the diet for a year. You can see a couple things here. One, everybody only lost a couple kilos of body weight. There was no difference between the two, and there was a wide amount of variability. And you can see that inactivity is rampant. Again, darker blue is worse. And these are people that get no physical inactivity per week. So you better move to Colorado or Utah if you want to be physically active. Now, solution one is to explain genetic risk and motivate behavior change. Very individualized approach, part of the whole precision medicine uh, zeitgeist, which is occurring. This is Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins was head of the National Human Genome Research Institute, now head of the NIH. In the late 2000s, he found out he had a, a, a risk variant conferring genotype for type 2 diabetes. He started to work out in exercise and lost a bit of weight. But what happens when you do a randomized clinical trial on this proposition? 
diabetes genetic risk counseling with currently available gene variants does not significantly alter self-reported motivation or prevention program adherence for overweight individuals at risk for diabetes. Dr. Collins is an unusual example. And my point about all this is why do we expect gene scores to succeed when bathroom scale scores have failed? All of us have very important health monitors at home. It's called the bathroom scale. If we weigh ourselves regularly, pay attention to it, and control our body weight, a lot of this is not a problem. But that's hard to do in the obesogenic environment with all this food variety that Tony talked about. So the solution number two is wearables. We'll get wearable devices. We'll get uh, tracked. We'll get feedback. And life will get better. That doesn't work either. It turns out when you do randomized clinical trials and give people wearables and dietary advice, the people who get dietary advice do people that do better than people that get dietary advice and wearables. This has been repeated over and over again. So humans, really, we're our own worst enemies. Now think about this. Think about if you had a heart attack and your doctor provided, uh, pr prescribed statins to you or blood pressure pills. You would think you'd be highly motivated to take those drugs. It turns out even the most extreme examples of motivation don't motivate people very well. And depending on how you do the trial, only between about 36% and 50% of patients fill their prescriptions for these drugs. Whether they fill them a second or third time is another issue, and whether they take the drugs correctly is a third issue. So it turns out people just don't take their drugs, just like they don't follow lifestyle advice. And this is perhaps why lifestyle interventions don't work. So you're probably all sick of this. You think I'm negative. You think we should all be depressed. And the simple question is, can we go home? No, you have to keep listening. The resolution, this is not all bad, but we're going to have to make some hard choices as a society and as a culture. So first of all, if followed, all diets work. If you look on the right side of this, this is a dietary adherence score, uh, 1 to 10, over the course of a year. And you look at the people who were most adherent, people that got 8s or 9s, they lost 20 kilos, independent of diet. So if people have the willpower or have the social uh, resources to actually comply, they do pretty well. But the problem is it's difficult. Now, what do we know about, again, the genome? These are data from a 100,000 genome uh, project in the United Kingdom where they've taken over 100,000 people, collected detailed health information, and also genotyped them. And you can see that people who do active transport to work, on average, are somewhere between 1.5 and 2.0 BMI units less. How many people think that that's a larger number than the biggest gene variant associated with a high BMI? How many people think that, that, that the gene variant is really trivial compared to this? How many people don't have the, the courage to take a position? They, they lack the courage gene variant. Well, the biggest gene variant in size is about 0.2 BMI units, and that's how big it is. That's how big it is. So we think a lot about uh, genetics. We think a lot about Kenyan runners. On the right, you, on, the, on my left or your left, we see uh, Kenyan kids running four kilometers to school. Here we see what people do in rich Western countries. And you can simply ask yourself, how genetic is this? So as a population, does anybody want to take a stab at this? Has a population ever gotten fitter and leaner in modern times? Anybody think that's ever happened? Some, one person says yes. How many people think it's never happened and we're just going to get fatter and, and less fit over and over again? Well, it did happen. Behavior change is easy. This happened in Cuba in the early 1990s. The Soviet Union collapsed. They quit sending the Cubans any oil. The Cubans bought either 500,000 or a million bicycles from the Chinese. They ate less, and essentially, we saw population-wide weight loss. And here's what happened. You can see that caloric consumption uh, dropped from about 2,800 calories a day to about 2,400 calories a day, and physical activity went up from about 2,500 calories a day, perhaps to, uh, um, uh, or at least the, the number of active individuals went up from about 30% to about 80%. What happened? The... Uh, Blue line in the middle shows that average BMI in that population was about 22. 
when the, when the uh, economic crisis started, the red line shows a shift to the left, and it became closer to 20. And then as food became more plentiful, things went back up. Now, we heard a lot about a palatable diet and sugar. Now, one, one dietary component was freely available in Cuba throughout this, and that was refined sugar. So people lost, on average, about 10 or 15 pounds in spite of the fact they were eating all, all the sugar they wanted. What's really interesting here, and these lines show the diabetes incidence and the obesity prevalence, and they essentially dropped by 50%, 50% to very, very low levels. But then, of course, they bounced right back up. So I like to use the clean water analogy. How many people here are happy there's clean water in their tap? Now, do we think the solution to, the, to clean water and sanitation is to educate people about the need for clean water and then tell them it's about a personal choice and each person or family is responsible? Some of you might uh, choose to boil your water. Some might choose to filter your water. Some might choose chemical treatment. Most probably would do nothing. Do we do that or do we build water and sewer systems? Well, of course, we've built water and sewer systems, and death from infectious disease in rich countries has dropped 95% in the last 200 years. 95%. So, but here's the problem, and this just shows us why are some population interventions for diet and obesity more equitable and effective than others? And this is the role of individual agency. Complicated slide, but this is about giving mothers folate to prevent uh, spina bifida and spinal cord disorders in babies. The top is hard to read, but you take the individual approach. You give a thousand women, offer them a leaflet at the doctor's office. The first square is 80% of them take the leaflet. The second square is 80% read the leaflet. The third square is that 80% understand the leaflet. The fourth square is that 80% of the, the, those 80 percent buy the drug or buy the folate at the pharmacy, and then the final is that they actually take it as directed. So you start off with 1,000 people, and if you do that kind of math, at the end, about 320 people are actually taking the compound. The other thing to do is just put it in the food supply, and, and then maybe some people don't want it in the food supply, and they decide to go to Whole Foods and buy unsupplemented bread, but 80% of people then get the benefit of folate in the diet. So you're going to have to do population-based interventions if you want this to work. So I'm all for the guidelines. I'm all for education. I'm happy people are doing genetic research. But we are kidding ourselves if we don't think uh, that we're going to have to use public health and population-based approaches to solve uh, the problems of obesity and inactivity. So the world, according to Mike Joyner, goes something like this. Exercise and diet are good. Evidence-based guidelines certainly can work. Personal responsibility and education uh, problem versus a public health problem. And I will argue that nothing happens until agricultural, food, planning, and transportation policies are changed. And to quote the great historian Arnold Toynbee, we need to recognize that civilizations die from suicide, not by murder. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Got a few questions here for you. Uh, uh, Robert Piera from uh, Charlton State University. Do you believe people that are genetically more susceptible to being obese will also be more susceptible to getting diabetes? Uh, I think you the, the genetic susceptibility to obesity and the gene risk variants that have been shown to um, be present in some populations have not been shown to be present in other populations. Mm -hmm. So if you take cohorts of humans born before 1943, you can't find gene variants associated with obesity. So I think really that lifestyle is the dominant thing here. And you can find some rare variants that cause type 2 diabetes, but by and large, the vast majority of it is going to be explained, not by genes, but just the obesogenic environment. People are physically inactive, and people are eating this high caloric, uh, density, tasty food. So this comes from Carlos here, um, and it comes back to your Cuba story. Yes. I, I'm not, it, so he says, how can government incentivize physical activity and dietary restrictions like that seen in, the, in Cuba in the 1990s without putting us through the things that Cuba went through? Well, yeah, well, they certainly have done it in, in the Netherlands and in, in Denmark. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think you have to do that. I think we have to think about sugar taxes, which are starting places. 
Philadelphia most recently, uh, we need to make our communities uh, more bike and walking friendly. Mm -hmm. and we probably have to rethink, you know, the suburbs and things like that. And, and probably, uh, you know, need to make people pay a lot to park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, if you've been they to... Do that, they do that here on campus, yeah, by the way. Yeah. If you, well, if you've been to Amsterdam or Copenhagen, you know, where are you going to park? Right. That's right. really the problem, so you better take your bike. Right. So here's someone who wants you to make a choice. This is from Aaron. Um, Aaron says, I think we need to address both, but would you focus efforts more on the energy intake or expenditure side with population-based strategy, basically, which is going to give us the bigger payoff, you Well, think? well I, I think we heard uh, from Herman earlier that 600 calories is the magic number. 600 yeah. calories of exercise is, is running six miles a day. Uh, if you look at some mailman, postman data, it, once people get to 15, 20,000 steps a day, which is probably 600 calories, they're generally protected from obesity. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's realistic to, for people to get that much physical activity. But maybe perhaps, and, and it's difficult to get people to, to stop eating. So, I, again, I think I would do both. And I've told this uh, uh, to many people. I personally think that Dr. Pepper is nectar of the gods. I love it. But I get the 8-ounce little cans to avoid the temptation when there's a 2-liter bottle right. Right. sitting in the uh, you know, refrigerator to just keep drinking the stuff. Right. So I think, I think we've really got to think about the whole supersize me thing. I think we have to think about portion control, but then I think we also have to get people, uh, you know, out walking. Right. So uh, this is from Blake here in the audience. And, and along this thing, uh, the, this same thought line that you're going, what do you think the first step is for most Americans to help them start changing their habits? Oh, I mean, we could start with, like, physical education in schools. We could start with, you know, the school, whole school lunch program is quite interesting because it was established as a result of World War II, when 30% of people after the Depression coming for induction were underweight. Mm. So I think we could start with healthy eating at schools. I think we could start with some, some uh, uh, again, I, I think the soda taxes are a good idea. And I, I think that uh, we do have to send people a positive message. And I think one of the things you don't want to do is tell people, well, you got to lose 30 pounds and you got to do 600 calories of exercise a, a week or a day. Because actually, even small weight loss or 10 minutes of physical activity begins to give people some benefit. Right. So I don't think we want to give people a hopeless uh, message, but I, want to, I think we want to make it easier right. for people to comply. Even drinking one less soda a day. Yeah. Well, or, ha yeah. yeah. And I think one thing people have to recognize is organ donation and, and nudging. Really a great example from Germany and Austria, countries that are culturally similar. In, in Germany, they have an opt-in thing, so you have to check a box if you want to be an organ donor, and about 15% of people opt in. In Austria, they have an opt-out program, and only 1% or 2% of people opt out. So in Germany, there's a shortage of organs, in, 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 and, in, there's in, and there's not. Right. So I think you have to think about those sorts of things. Yeah. How do you approach it? Yeah, right. How do you approach it? Me, me per yeah, I, well, you know, I think you got to think about how coercive you want society to be. Right how much you want to nudge people, and, and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to think about the social cost. And, and if, if uh, we thought about the real cost of cars and we thought about how they're subsidized in many, many ways, uh, biking, walking, and, and other things maybe don't look so bad. Certainly, um, there's a lot of agricultural subsidies which are counterproductive. Sure. Thank you so much for Thank your time you. today. Yep. Thank you.